Welcome everybody to this talk about positive corporate climate lobbying. Uh, welcome our online audience as well. This event is hosted by LSE government. Uh, I'm Francisco Garcia Gibson. I'm a research fellow at the Department of Government and I'm delighted to chair today's discussion. I'm going to make a few announcements before I introduce the speakers. We have, as I mentioned, an online audience, and the event is also being recorded and will probably be available on the LSE website in a few days. Uh, a few words about the structure. First, the speakers are going to give their opening thoughts in about 10 minutes each. I'm going to ask them a few questions, and then we'll get questions from the audience. If you are part of the online audience, Please introduce your questions in the chat on Zoom, and then Marie Gilles will read them out loud. We expect to end around 6.30. Please put your phones in silence. If you want to tweet about the event, use the hashtag LSE Climate, uh, yeah, please. Okay, uh, I'm going to introduce the speakers in the order they will be speaking. Ed Collins here on my left, uh, he's director at Influence Map, a think tank that analyzes the impact of business on the climate crisis. Uh, also did a master's here at the LSE. Claire Richards, she's currently head of engagement at the IIGCC, that's the Institutional Investor Group on Climate Change. Oh, she's also comment from the Church of England Pension Sport. And Fergus Green, uh, he's lecturer in political theory and public policy in the Department of Political Science at UCL. He works on the ethics, politics, and governance of climate change, and he's also a graduate at, uh, of the LSC. Uh, he completed an LSC in the philosophy department and then a PhD in the Department of Government. So I'm going to introduce the topic very briefly before the speakers. Uh, so corporations have been lobbying on climate-related policy for long now, uh, most intensely since the end of the 1980s. But most of the lobbying has been obstructionist or negative, so uh, seeking to stop or delay ambitious climate policy. In this talk, we want to motivate reflection on the other side of the story. Uh, that's positive climate lobbying, uh, so climate aligned. It's called sometimes the price agreement aligned. Lobbying, understanding lobbying as attempts to in directly or indirectly influence policy. Some context, uh, let me mention the, the main actors in this place, so to say. So public officials who corporations are trying to influence, businesses, so both incorporated and non-incorporated businesses and lobby. Uh, business associations are important here. They also lobby regarding climate policy. Investors, institutional investors, also lobby and also try to influence, use the shareholder power to get uh, corporations to lobby positively climate. And a few, three important developments in the uh, recent developments on this topic. One is in, in the past 10, 20 years, Corporations are starting lobbying positively more intensely. Some business associations have published guides and standards for positive climate lobbying. One example is the Global Standard on Responsible Climate Lobbying, which the LSC collaborated in developing and which was published earlier this year. And another important event is that. There's a massive investor coalition called Climate Action 100 Plus. This is an international investor coalition, which publishes a, a benchmark called the Net Zero Company Benchmark for investors to assess the companies they invest or plan to invest in. And since recently, uh, that benchmark includes climate lobbying as an indicator. So if, if a company lobbies positively, they run better on this benchmark. So with this, these developments as a context, I hope this event helps us understand the extent of positive corporate lobbying, the motivations behind it, 
and discuss some concerns about it. So we will hear first from Ed Collins. So Ed, when you're ready, please go ahead. Brilliant. Um, thanks very much. It's, it's really brilliant to be back. Um, apologies for the slightly budget uh, notes. I put that on my phone. So um, since 2015, since the Paris Agreement, uh, non-state actors, um, both in the corporate and financial sectors, have been encouraged to become partners to global climate action. And this has been seen um, amongst important parts of the climate movement as an important strategy for progressing efforts towards uh, delivering on the Paris Agreement's goals. Um, amongst other things, uh, this has resulted in, uh, what I'd say is it's a pretty huge surge in nominally positive high-level statements from companies uh, around Paris Agreement and net zero, um, sort of commitments uh, around sort of binding and voluntary GHG emission reductions, uh, and other, other things that I would generally class under the category of climate PR. Um, and this time of the year uh, around the COP process is always a bit of a hotspot for this kind of activity. Um, at the same time, uh, there's been pretty limited progress on policy or national level policy on climate at the same time. Um, I'm sure many of you saw the, uh, the report last week from the UN Environmental Programme that evaluated government climate action as quote unquote, woefully inadequate. Um, and the UNEP, UNEP's words there reiterate, I think the increasingly urgent warnings that we've heard from the scientific community on climate in recent years, um, summed up most comprehensively by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, so to, to be specific, what scientists are telling us is needed uh, is, is regulation and policy. So far reaching and binding policy to both address GHG emissions and to initiate um, and guide the sort of rollout of enumerate sort of transitions to zero and low, low carbon technologies across the entire economy. Um, so before I got into the trends around positive climate lobbying, I wanted to address this mismatch first, and that's the mismatch between seemingly widespread supportive statements from the corporate sector around the Paris Agreement and other high level climate initiatives and the lack uh, of government action. So my organization, Influence Map, uh, uh, correctly introduced as, a, as an independent think tank, we, one of the main things uh, we do is track and assess how detailed lobbying uh, on climate policy um, is, is being done by the largest companies in the world, along with their industry associations that represent them. Um, and what we've seen is despite uh, the high level, the trend in high level and nominative, nominally positive statements from companies, that when it comes down to engagement and discussion on specific regulations in, at the, in the national level and local level, there's a very different picture. And we've seen time and again that key policy debates are dominated by active and very powerful lobbyists representing the fossil fuel value chain, um, or in other words, uh, the likely losers of an energy transition. Um, so we understand this imbalance of influence at this detailed level to be maybe one of the most important blockages of national level climate policy and, and therefore progress towards delivering on the Paris Agreement's goals. Um, you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, the IPCC recognizes this trend uh, in common fossil fuel interests as a barrier to Paris aligned action. And leaders, political leaders from Barack Obama and Christiana Vigueres, uh, the former executive secretary of the UNFCCC, and also the current UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has always all uh, pointed to this trend as a key barrier to, to climate action. Um, so, a little bit of a, a downer to start with there. Um, but I wanted to set that out as, as the context from where I now see we've, we've recently seen much more positive trends around um, positive uh, corporate climate lobbying, which is the topic of this, this discussion. Um, and I think, yeah, so I think we're seeing reaction or companies or the corporate sector react to uh, the sort of or face up to what it actually means to deliver on the Paris Agreement goals and their own net zero targets. There's probably two reactions to this. Uh, on the one hand, you're getting companies that were never genuinely on board in the first place starting to step back from their commitments, uh, a trend that's recently been dubbed green hushing, which I quite like. And uh, yes, uh, yeah, that's, I think we're all reminded here of recent events surrounding the GFRAN's initiative, Mark Carney's initiative with the big banks. Uh, on the other hand, more and more companies are genuinely engaging in positive climate advocacy. And I mean here 
to distinguish this from the kind of high level statements I was talking at the start. Now, what I mean here is genuinely strategic engagement on, on a number of different levels. Um, so this uh, would utilize various tactics uh, in the playbook, playbook um, and go far beyond sort of high level sign on letters. So you might see companies initiate PR campaigns using social media and media and letters and into the, to the press and using their CEO to um, do op-eds and things like that. But you will also see companies engage at a very detailed level, um, directly meeting with policymakers or sending consultation responses, um, advocating on the specific policies that they'd like to see and also responding to the proposals being put out by governments. And, and this uh, is the key important thing. So a couple more minutes if that's okay. Um, so I think there are two, two main types of company getting involved in this. The first is kind of obvious, industry that see a clear business case for progressive climate action. And so this sort of advocacy is very much in line with their border business strategy. Um, so utility and power companies in Europe that have invested heavily in renewables are an obvious example for this. Certain companies within the automotive sector, not all of them, only certain companies that are starting to push for EVs um, would be another example. Um, and I think we'll see momentum around this build as the transition um, gains pace. Um, although we're quite a long way away from the kind of interest and coalition of interests around these technologies being able to match sort of the fossil fuel industry in terms of the, the lobbying, lobbying power. There's a, a second sort of much broader range of business interests that are beginning to realize um, that while they don't operate in sort of an energy transition sector or a sector directly impacted, impacted by the energy transition, they need robust government guidance and support to deliver on their own climate and net zero goals. And these are a little bit more interesting because they are investing in policy and political influencing activities that are arguably outside the short term direct sort of profit driven motivation, motivations of their business. Um, and we see companies like Unilever and Self, Salesforce, and some examples of these. Um, so, to, just to sum up uh, or to, to finish on two observations that I think we've seen is really important for companies starting to engage in positive corporate climate lobbying. Um, and the first is from a governance perspective. Um, and we've seen that it really requires high level, top levels of C suite buy in uh, and engagement um, to en enable companies to to positively and strategically engage on, on climate policy. Otherwise, it, it gets a bit stuck with a sustainability team, and there might be these high-level sign-on statements a company can do, but they don't tend to then have the resources and backing to engage strategically at the kind of level that I've been talking about. Um, and the second really important point I want to finally finish on, uh, and I think the most important aspect of positive climate lobbying that some of these companies are taking on, is not just engaging directly with the policy, but also looking at their I guess, influence value chain and there's sort of other entities they engage with or might have memberships to particularly industry associations. And a, an important trend of companies starting to sort of review what memberships they have to industry associations and figure out whether these groups are representing them positively or in fact lobbying negatively on climate policy, which we see um, some of the most oppositional entities in the economy are these big cross-sector industry associations that claim to talk on the entire economy on behalf of the entire economy, but really um, represent only fossil fuel interests. Um, so positive companies in the system starting to look at those industry groups and saying, well, we need to really reform these groups and move these groups. That is the most important, I think, and impactful part of positive climate lobbying that we've picked up uh, in our system. And that is very much um, related to, and uh, I think thank, we must uh, rep, give thanks to, I think the investor movement on this that have been pushing on that particular issue very hard. Uh, and with that, pass it. Thank you very much, Edward. That was very comprehensive. Uh, very clear, please. Thanks. Um, so I've been tasked with um, identifying why companies, the reasons why companies might choose to lobby positively. Um, I don't work for a company. Uh, my insights on this are through having engaged with many companies over recent years on behalf of the Church and Pensions Board and working with other investors that do that as part of IIGCC, which is the European um, Investor Network on uh, Climate Change. Um, but I mean, we were just having a little chat um, that some of you may have heard before this started. And I think, you know, there's 
Unfortunately, some of this is currently theoretical. I suppose, you know, there are reasons, there are certainly reasons why it's in the interests of companies to lobby positively. But as Ed was saying, you know, we're, we're kind of at quite an early stage still of kind of actually seeing this play out in practice. Um, but I think, you know, paramount amongst the reasons why a company might lobby positively is self-interest. Ed mentioned, you know, kind of the um, competitive advantage um, where companies have already developed the technology or they've, you know, they've already got the investments in place to future-proof uh, their production facilities or, you know, whatever their line of business is. It's, um, uh, you know, an additional kind of boost to their business strategy if they can make sure that their competitors are having to kind of run to catch up with that because they're already kind of on the path. So there's that level of self-interest. Um, but there's also potentially, you know, a level of self-interest in, in terms of lobbying positively in order to um, level the, the playing field. You know, we often talk to companies um, that say, you know, we kind of, we want to do this. We recognize that it's, it's necessary for us to do this. We see this as the direction things are going in, but they have quite often well-founded concerns that actually they're going to be penalized um, potentially financially um, through you know, the prices um, that they end up charging um, compared with their peers that aren't taking those steps or penalized by investors that will be kind of asking, well, why, you know, what, why are you uh, going further and faster than you need to um, on decarbonization? So they're interested in leveling the playing field so that actually the entire industry kind of has to make that move. So then, then the opportunity kind of costs of them doing that are, are reduced. Um, so a kind of altruistic self-interest, really, you know. Um, and I think also, so kind of self-interest being the kind of first grouping, a second bucket is pragmatism, um, that it's, you know, a recognition that decarboni decarbonizing the economy is vital, that it's inevitable, that this is the direction that things need to move in, that it's not that they're naysayers necessarily on, on the science, um, but, you know, they identify that in order to avoid um, the kind of type of populist uh, policies or cliff edge kind of scenarios where the predictability that companies you know, thrive on, that investors like, the kind of predictability in which they can actually deploy their business strategy without kind of it veering around on the road, in order to kind of create those conditions that it's pragmatic of them to actually engage constructively and proactively on, on trying to actually help have a stage transition rather than kind of sit it out and kind of wait until the last minute and, and then have to deal with the consequences of that. Um, and I think the third kind of bucket is then the sort of social license kind of side of things. Uh, so re reputation, basically. Um, and I think there are really important drivers for that um, from the kind of value space of their current or potential or prospective workforce and the expectations that, you know, particularly for, well, for any company really, um, that actually it's quite a competitive job market, that their workforce actually in order to infuse, inspire, retain them, it's not just about throwing lots of money, but kind of people increasingly want um, to actually be able to identify their own values in the kind of place that they're spending a lot of their, their work time and they don't want their kind of disconnect, a dissonant kind of um, a clash between those. Um, so, you know, that can be a driver. And I think, you know, that we've seen obviously some quite interesting movements um, within, and again, debate how successful they've been so far, but say within the likes of Amazon, um, where you actually do have the employee base kind of agitating from the inside. And I think, you know, I mean, along with lobbying um, kind of in terms of how that brings about change in the policy environment, the change that's brought about in the behaviour of companies, it's an ecosystem. You know, there are lots of different drivers to that. There's the kind of external side of things um, where the reputational damage to the brand becomes, you know, potentially too much of a risk and they want to manage that. And then there's the internal side where, um, yeah, 
they're wanting to kind of align with their with their workforce um and obviously yeah, we're all consumers as well i think the the signals that um that we all send to companies as well the kind of um, campaigns that are run, but also um, just generally what, you know, companies are very sensitive to changing norms in society and, you know, to, to the marketing, yes, the green PR kind of side of things, but, you know, that their entire business is about predicting where, um, or, or most businesses and certainly their marketing departments are about predicting future trends. And if they see that actually society is moving to an expectation of companies acting in a particular way, they want to be ahead of that trend, you know, they want to be kind of presenting that, that they're, they have a solution to it, that they're already ahead. Um, lovely. <laughs> um, and, and I think, you know, ultimately, um, and as I said, I mean, I, I come from the investor perspective on this, but a key reason why companies, to a certain extent, are, and certainly why they should um, be lobbying positively on, on climate um climate policy is simply you know credibility um credibility and the legitimacy of their place in the transition because i mean ed referred to kind of companies sort of setting net zero targets or, or saying that they're doing one thing and then actually when you look at it you kind of poke it a little bit it turns out that it, it sort of disintegrates into dust actually if a company is saying well we've, we've set a 2050 net zero target we're setting these short-term, medium targets maybe of, of how to get there, but if they're then not actually, if they don't have a plan of how policy fits into that, the type of regulatory environment that needs to be in place for them to be able to deliver on that, it rings very hollow. Um, so what investors have been increasingly looking for, and as um, Francisco said, is the Global Standard on Responsible Climate Lobbying, uh, which Dr. Richard Perkins um, at the LSE was very um, centrally involved in, in helping to create that framework. A, a key um, aspect of that is about saying to companies, well, what are the policies? What are the ideal policy conditions that you need in order to deliver this trans transition strategy that, that you're setting out? And how are you actually helping to, you know, how are you contributing to uh, making those reality? I think that's the key part, like kind of saying, okay, it's not necessarily that things are the way they are, that they you need them to be right at the moment, but about how you're projecting into the future, saying, well, this is the part that our company can play in actually helping to deliver what is basically necessary for our business to thrive in the future. So I think those three kind of aspects of positive lobbying was quite a compelling case there. And hopefully over the kind of coming months and years, we'll, we'll manage to get more companies on side as well with delivering that. Thank you very much, Claire. That was very insightful. And Fos, want... Yeah, thanks very much, Francisco. It's great to be back at the LSE. Uh, I'm going to be providing perhaps a slightly more academic perspective on similar themes. Um, I should say that I'm not an expert on lobbying per se, but I do work on, among other things, the politics and political economy of climate change action, and in that context have, uh, you know, have done some work on um, the political strategies of, of firms um, and, and other, other interest groups. So I want to start by, uh, being, the, being the academic on the, on the panel, start by perhaps providing a definition and some stylized facts. So political scientists typically define lobbying as the transfer of information in private meetings and venues between interest groups and politicians and their staff. Now, information is used very broadly in this sense. That could be factual information like evidence, facts, statistics, or projections, but could also be things like arguments, uh, persuasive tactics, even threats. Uh, or signals or some kind of combination of these. And it's also worth noting that in, in, important in this definition that information is crucial um, and that money being transferred is not part of the definition. And this is one of the things that distinguishes lobbying from say campaign contributions. And it's worth just noting that lobbying is only one of a, a wide repertoire of actions that any political actor could take, but certainly that that politically engaged firms and industry groups could take. 
And much of, I'll, I'll try as much as possible to confine my remarks to lobbying, but inevitably some of what I say will also apply to this larger repertoire of, of tactics and actions. So a, a few star life facts about uh, lobbying, and most of the academic literature comes from the, the United States, though not, though not all, all of it, um, but I think a lot of these facts apply fairly broadly, if not universally. So number one, corporations and trade associations comprise the vast majority of lobbying expenditures by interest groups. And I'm going to assume, as is pretty reasonable, I think, that firms and industry associations lobby for the reason uh, to secure a policy and legal environment that's favourable to their interests in capital accumulation, making money, in short. Right? Um, somewhat obviously, but worth saying that more lobbying tends to occur when the stakes are higher and when the issue is more salient. And finally, in terms of stylized facts, it's important to note that lobbying, like other forms of political mobilization, is costly. And so it requires resources. And perhaps more subtly, in, what's important is it involves a free rider problem. So particular policies will generally, or laws, will generally affect a large class of actors, be they individuals or firms, um, in a similar way, right? Maybe firms in the same industry. Uh, or, or large segments of the population. And um, so every, every member of that class has an incentive to free ride on another member of the class essentially paying the costs of doing the lobbying. Now, Mansa Olson's uh, famous insight from the 1960s is that what this means is that a small class of actors has stronger incentives to organise, to overcome those free rider problems than a larger class of actors, all else equal. So, for example, a small group of large, you know, uh, powerful firms could gain quite significant benefits um, from lobbying, so they could avoid, you know, costly policies, and that they're more likely to to lobby, to mobilise politically than a much larger group of individuals or firms where the costs or, or the benefits from lobbying or the cost of the policy are spread out diffusely among them. So in, in summary of the stylized facts, so lobbying is dominated by corporations who seek to, seek to shape the rules of the game to make more money. Uh, they lobby more when the stakes are higher and the issues are more salient. And large uh, firms in sectors where there are relatively few firms have an advantage in the lobbying game. And I want to argue that this is bad news for climate change on the whole. So why is it bad? Well, climate relevant policies and laws, and I use that term climate relevant for reasons that will become clear in a moment, they affect industries in which there are relatively few large firms, by and large, okay? So uh, I'm going to call these carbon dependent industries. I see Michael's in the front row here. This is the term that he used in a recent paper of his, which I strongly recommend in the American Journal of Political Science, I believe. Um, and so th the point here is to emphasize not just firms that are emissions intensive, that emit a lot of greenhouse gases, but also those who provide inputs to or receive inputs from emissions intensive firms. Um, and so just to list a few, that's obviously fossil fuel producers, fossil fuel based electric utilities, also heavy industrial producers that directly emit greenhouse gases or use a lot of energy, like steel, aluminium, cement, chemicals, pulp and paper, automotive manufacturers, airlines, shipping companies, agricultural firms, and forestry firms. Okay, that's kind of the broad kind of context. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's fine, that's fine, that's about right. Um, so most attention to lobbying in the climate literature has focused on specific climate laws. And that's important, and I'll come to that in a minute, but I think it's the wrong place to start. So I think it's important to understand, first of all, that these firms lobby on a whole range of policy issues that affect their capital accumulation goals. Um, and essentially, in a context where their greenhouse gas emissions are not regulated, the more that these firms produce, and therefore so the more that they lobby so that the laws can change so they can produce more, essentially, the more they drive climate change as a problem. 
And so we could think, for example, about lobbying on fossil fuel subsidies, um, favourable tax regimes, sector-specific regulation that promotes their interests around technology standards and licences, but also just the wider pro-business and indeed pro-shareholder regulatory environment, lax corporate tax regimes, weak consumer environmental and environmental protections, weak labour laws, et cetera, et cetera. And most of these issues don't attract the same scrutiny as, as climate does. So I just wanted to kind of highlight that first. And now I'll kind of come to the points about climate change laws and policies specifically. So uh, we know, and, and I can kind of refer to what Ed's already said here, that, uh, that lobbying against climate change laws has been prevalent um, and that this lobbying affects the existence as well as the content and also the enforcement of specific climate laws. And, and I agree with Ed's characterization that you know, the inadequate climate legislation we see around the world is probably in large part due to lobbying, certainly due to the, the full repertoire of corporate tactics. So um, the, I want to sort of the last couple of, spend my last couple of minutes talking about, uh, so thinking about the balance between this kind of, call it negative lobbying and the policy lobby, uh, positive lobbying that's, that we're discussing on this panel. So if we think about kind of who, who's on the other side of, you know, so we've talked about who some of the actors could be that might uh, have an incentive to lobby positively. And what I, what I basically just want to do in the last couple of minutes is sort of think about a couple of theoretical models for thinking about um, the matchups, if you will, between the sort of negative lobbyists and the potential positive lobbyists. And I'm going to look at two matchups. So one is sort of the, the losers from the transition, right, fossil fuel companies and so on, versus the losers from climate change itself. And an influential paper by Colgan Hale and Green, not me, um, Jessica Green, uh, no relation, they, they model a, a climate politics as essentially a conflict between these two, two camps, what they call climate vulnerable asset holders and uh, uh, climate forcing asset holders, so those who are vulnerable to the transition. And they note that both of these groups face existential threats, one from climate change, one from climate policy. And they argue that politics is going to play out as increasingly as a kind of as a contest between these, these groups. However, and this is, I think, a point perhaps relevant for, for discussion among this group, is that I think that they overemphasize the incentives that climate vulnerable asset holders have to lobby at a domestic level, given that the climate benefits um, are essentially a global collective good, and they're also a long-term good. Whereas those who are vulnerable to the transition, they're lobbying um, for national policies that will adversely affect them, so they have a stronger incentive to mobilise. The other matchup that I'll cover is um, between transitional losers again and the transitional winners. And both Claire and Ed have, have spoken about this a little bit, but I think broadly this is a theoretically a more promising in the sense that. Um, the transitional winners, so the green energy firms and so on, do have similar kinds of incentives to lobby at the national level. And whilst they currently don't match the firepower of the transitional losers, it's plausible that over time that firepower will increase and so that balance will tip to some extent. However, I, I suppose the cautionary tale there is that um, this kind of model, I think, might work better in contexts where there is political space for kind of centrist bargaining among industrial actors, so corporatist contexts like in, uh, in the European continent. And I wonder whether the kind of scope conditions of this model apply so well to more pluralistic and competitive political economies like the United States. Um, because I think there we already see that there's a lot of partisan polarization that re reduces the space for kind of elite bargains in the center, um, there's more attention to public opinion uh, and so on. And it's, I also worry that these kind of elite compromises end up just being incremental rather than the kinds of transformative policies that we need. So I'll just conclude by saying that uh, I, I'd be interested to sort of discuss and maybe perhaps there'll be questions about this in terms of, you know, the, the role of financial actors who are universal owners and long-term investors and therefore potentially have incentives to engage in positive lobbying as potential climate change losers. And I'd be interested to sort of explore the question of why 
they're not positive, positively lobbying as much as we might think, given if, if they're long-term investors and universal owners. Universal owners meaning that they're, they're, they invest in a lot of assets, right? So they have, and they need to worry not just about the adverse effects of climate legislation on the fossil fuel industry, but about the whole climate and that's how it's going to affect their whole portfolio. So that would be my kind of question for discussion. And I suppose one other potentially interesting issue is sort of the role of positive lobbying outside of the US and the EU and sort of the bigger countries that are kind of more, more well studied and, and, and thought about. So I'll leave it there and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, much for this. That was very incisive. So I have a few questions for the panel. If you, if you also want to answer Fergus questions uh, for free, let me start with Ed. You know, think tank studies, corporations try to do them through lobbying. And how responsive do you think public officials are to that lobbying? So how, how influential is particularly positive lobbying? Perhaps in different contexts, because I guess it varies from context to context. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I think starting with the caveat that, well, obviously I, I think and it's been recognised that, that lobbying, especially in the corporate sector, is super important um, when it comes to the formation of policy. The policy process in general is very complex. There are a lot of inputs and there are a lot of conditions that affect it, and so even the assessments that we do on companies to try and understand where they're lobbying and, and what they want doesn't necessarily mean that they're having that, that impact. It's, it's a very complex kind of topic to study. Um, but I think there are probably two reasons why, uh, why we see um, government officials being receptive. Um, one, generally, business buy-in for a policy idea is really important. Um, uh, we live in, you know, the generally political contexts um, are as such where the economy is important and being able to prove uh, that a certain policy has the credentials of being backed by business um, is really important for policymakers, but also in, in civil service, but also politicians to uh, win support for them and, uh, and therefore be able to um, pass them and uh, enact them as well. Um, the other side of the equation is uh, the sort of more specific transition of knowledge from, from one group of actors to the other. Um, the private sector, particularly companies, have uh, a significant uh, wealth of um, understanding and technical expertise on, on the topics that these, uh, these policies are related to. Um, on the other hand, from the conversations that we have, we understand generally policymakers tend to be very time poor uh, and very welcoming to any additional information they can get. And help on, on development of policy. Um, so if they get a nice, uh, well set out, detailed position from a company or an industry association directly relevant to the policy area and they're trying to uh, make some progress on, it's incredibly helpful um, for them. Um, now you sort of asked me to, that, yeah, I mean that would be like an ideal context, I guess. Fergus mentioned the slightly more difficult <laughs> circumstances in more thought political context like like the US where I guess the, the politics of the situation is also a very big determining factor. Um, I guess my, my response to that would be just going back to the definition of lobbying. So there is that narrow, more narrow definition of lobbying, which is that sort of direct company to policymaker engagement. Um, in our research, we use a slightly wider definition. We take it from a, a UN um, guide on positive climate lobbying, I think it was from 2013, that also includes, um, I think what the global standard refers to as indirect policy engagement. So trying to influence the broader political uh, debate as a sort of indirect tactic for helping deliver the policy in the long term. Um, and this is definitely something that is aggressively used uh, by the fossil fuel value chain and politicizing the entire climate agenda and certain aspects of it has been, you know, a very specific part of what they've been trying they try to do um, going back you know, a couple of decades. Um, so still you can see where the, the companies might be able to have some some impact even in those uh, circumstances. Great. Thank you. So a question from Claire. What do companies think of the political influence, particularly um, do they think it's compatible with democratic ideals? Um, I guess that's Kind of two parts in there. I think in terms of what they, oops, what they think of yeah. the, no, 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 so I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just splitting it and answering because I think what they think of it 
Um, I mean, I can refer a couple of times to the, the Global Summit on Responsible Climate Lobbying. We did a couple of public consultations um, when we were um, kind of researching and distilling the indicators for that. And one of the really interesting things that came up in the first consultation was the really divergent views between what companies thought of their level of influence on policy and basically what everyone else who was responding for. And those two things were like, I mean, it actually made me laugh when, when I looked at the analysis because it was like, wow, that's, um, yeah, very different viewpoints on what is basically the same, the same thing. So I think, you know, they, in terms of their influence on the democratic process, you know, they see themselves, I suppose, or the conversations I've had with them, they see themselves as a legitimate kind of contributor to that. Um, Ed referred to, um, I mean, I suppose what I'd refer to as their, their, what they see as their kind of quality control role, you know, that, that they feel that they're being uh, pragmatic and they're the ones that will be having to implement, you know, the, the regulations that come out um, or are impacted by the regulations that come out of, of this. So they're kind of almost stress testing uh, being the adults in the room and whether this is actually going to kind of work in practice and, and feeding in on, on that basis. So that tends to be um, what they share about where, you know, where they think. And so it's definitely that they see themselves as being um, a legitimate actor. And I think, that, you know, the issue is then where the balance of power is in that. And I mean, as has been referred to, that um corporations and the uh, business kind of associations that, that they're members of are you know very laser focused on particular areas of policy in a way that even you know environmental interest groups don't quite have the they don't have the resource um or often the access to be influencing so it's, it's where there's that power imbalance that it kind of becomes a, you know a, a shake um, on, on democratic values, I suppose. Um, but this is where you know, transparency is key so that companies, you know, if they're being clear on what their intent is and they're being clear, you know, what, what actions they're taking to back that up, um, that then that can help to um, bring a level of scrutiny to it um, so that various stakeholders including you know, investors but you know most importantly I think that the, the, the kind of well, importantly the public can um, see what is happening behind closed doors and in kind of consultations that they're not necessarily, necessarily privy to and one final thing that I would say as well is again the global standard one of the things that that encourages companies to do is to actually involve stakeholders you know, stakeholders as in uh, the, the communities where they operate, the um, workers um, within within the company, um, people who are affected by the issues at stake, to involve um, the, those identified stakeholders actually in forming the policies and kind of testing the policies that the company kind of says that it, it wants to kind of advocate for. So that again, that kind of brings a bit of legitimacy to it, that it's not just from the point of view of this is in our short-term business interest so um you know that's what we're kind of pursuing but actually that there's a broad range of views that have already gone into the distillation of that policy position which the company then goes on to kind of back in practice great thank you Fergus, a similar question more from the moral political perspective do you have any more political concerns uh, about positive corporate lobbying, particular do you, do you worry that it might be an undemocratic form of influence? Yeah, sure. So I think I'd start by saying I don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong with lobbying. And particularly in a representative democracy, which is the dominant form of democracy, I think lobbying can be an important and valuable way in which representatives gain information about their citizens' views, and also information relevant to the effects of the, the policies that they're considering implementing. But I think that under current conditions, there are some massive problems with clearly with the way lobbying works. And just to highlight two, which have been touched on throughout our discussion. Number one is this, the secrecy of lobbying. So lobbying is currently, I think, too secretive and there's insufficient transparency. 
Um, and this needs to be much more tightly regulated. Of course, there are limits to what can be done, particularly when we're talking about private meetings, but there are better and worse uh, degrees of, of transparency. And a lot of lobbying is very, very untransparent and very unregulated. The second problem, which we've highlighted a lot, is really the power asymmetry among the potential pool of lobbyists in any given democracy. So we, even if we put aside business corporations and you just look at citizens, clearly citizens have vastly different capacities with which to engage in lobbying their, their representatives. Uh, and once you add business corporations into the mix, the, you know, the, the power asymmetry becomes immense. Business corporations are capital accumulation machines and you know, the largest ones are very, very, very effective at lobbying and that has a hugely distortive effect on democracy. And it's corrupting, corrupting in the classical Republican sense, not necessarily of quid pro quo corruption, but just corruption in the sense of uh, involving the triumph of private sectional interests over the public good. So under these conditions, I do think that it is more valuable to have other firms engaging in positive climate lobbying. I think the balance imbalance is so, so high and the task so urgent that uh, it's better to have other firms engaging in positive climate lobbying. But I do, I do worry, and I'm sure uh, my colleagues on the panel share some of these worries, and I'd be interested to sort of hear more about uh, the responses to these, I suppose, just to three, three worries from a kind of democratic perspective and more generally. So I worry about what exactly is being lobbied for within the category of positive lobbying. In particular, I suspect that a lot of businesses who would at least claim to be doing positive lobbying would be advocating for relatively incrementalist forms of change rather than the kinds of transformative, large-scale, urgent change that we need. Secondly, I worry about the difficulty of measuring and monitoring companies' claims about positive lobbying, and Claire touched on this, and of course this is the secrecy problem, but it would be interesting to see whether as part of positive climate lobbying there's also an attempt to address these more systemic issues around the transparency of lobbying itself. Um, and then thirdly, I suppose, the, the worry is, even though I, I'm sort of advocating that we have more climate lobbying given the current power imbalance, I do worry that this further entrenches the, the deep, the, the democratic deficit that characterises a lot of representative democracies today. And I suppose in the long run, I would like to see uh, forms of democracy in which lobbying plays a much more limited role. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, now we have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, let's do, uh, let's start with the questions in the room and then we move to the online questions. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to please raise your hands. And if you have a question, wait, wait for the microphone to, to get to you. If possible, introduce yourself, saying your name and occupation if you want. And that's it. So, and Maddie will, will get the, the microphone to you. So please raise your hands. We have a question over there. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm Owen Tutt. Um, I work in investor engagement on climate change as well. Um, I have two questions, if I may. One more practical and, and one a bit more theoretical. And, and we've touched on the, the, well, you've touched on the first one already uh, excellently. Um, so it, it's when it gets down into the detail of, of lobbying, how do investors, NGOs, the public, think tanks um, measure and assess positive climate lobbying when we don't yet know many of the technologies and business models that will best deliver the transition and will do so sustainably and, and equitably? And the second is, um, to what extent do we have a bit of a chicken and egg problem where companies aren't willing to start allocating capital to deliver transformative decarbonisation without the policy uncertainty, policy certainty, sorry, and then governments aren't willing to deliver the policy um, before companies start investing and allocating capital in the, the technology and um, and enabling factors that will give them certainty that the economy can survive sort of transformative decarbonization and is positive corporate climate lobbying necessary and, and sufficient to, to make that link uh, uh, between uh, uh, 
corporate action and, and government action. Right, thank you. So we have two questions, one on how to measure positive loading and then uh, the, the other one on uncertainty, whether positive loading can provide some certainty to, to government and corporations. So yeah, feel free to take them as you want. Um, you, Owen, and seeing you in the room, that you'd come up with some uh, very <laughs> cutting to um, the centre kind of questions. Um, that first one, um, how do how can we kind of measure um, positive lobbying? And I suppose the unintended consequences as well, isn't it? That we kind of lock in, you know, potentially lock in um, inadvertently bad uh, outcomes. I mean, in investors asking, you know, expecting companies now to um, put their cards on the table about the policy kind of environment that they think is necessary. Um, you know, that that in itself needs to constitute, say, the rationale for that, that kind of policy path and what the assumptions are within it. And yeah, transparency in terms of where the, you'd be needing to cross-reference that with where the company is at at the moment in terms of its own kind of transition planning and, and implementation to see where the vested interests are um, within that. Um, but I think in, in terms of monitoring that, you know, that will be, or monitoring the potential impact, that will be one, uh, I mean, whilst we're saying about the kind of in asymmetry of it, with more transparency over what positions are being taken and what the basis for those is, it should be that, you know, we can collectively discern actually what the better path is, because I mean, certainly on kind of, um lower kind of carbon and, and no carbon energy sources say there's a lot of debate we see, we see this in particular um within um one of the industries is within the car sector uh, the automotive sector where some some companies will say well we're not supporting we're not supporting this partic this particular um policy intervention because we don't see EVs, electric vehicles, as being the future technology. We think that hydrogen is the kind of smart bet. There will always, you know, the, you ask 10 different companies, you're probably going to get definitely three different answers on it. But I think having the transparency over where, why they're getting to, um, to the, the kind of point that they are and enabling academics and NGOs and analysts within, you know, the, the kind of analysts that are within the finance space to be able to look at that and actually, you know, apply apply their, their, their intellect to discerning what's the kind of correct course to be taking. We would be in a much better position than we are now, which is where it's just very black box uh, and just the big assumption that they're, you know, as we said at the start, that companies are lobbying on the basis of preserving the technology that they have now and the you know the, it's kind of lobbying on convenience rather than lobbying on the basis of where we need to get to. Anyone else? Yeah, no, I can jump in. Yeah, just to sort of on the second part of the first question, um, in terms of so the, the, the sort of two aspects of this, this kind of the how do you how do you monitor lobbying generally? And then I think the second part of your question kind of goes to given that we don't know what the technological pathways will be and so on. And I suppose the sort of standard economist answer to the second part is, well, we, we have technology, new, you, you lobby for technology neutral climate policy, like a carbon tax or an emissions trading scheme. Um, I, you know, I think that's perhaps a little bit politically naive. Um, and I think the more, the probably more realistic answer is that uh, the, the, the transition will involve quite a lot of technology steering kind of industrial policy and and that the industrial policy pathway that the governments pursue kind of will be the one that crowds in the sort of the, the private sector capital so so I feel like it's not it's not like there's a kind of neutral market and government kind of has to pick it like government will steer the transition so I think it's about doing better doing better and avoiding worse forms of industrial policy and then on the, on the chicken and egg problem, I think this is a big problem that, you, that you've touched upon. It's a big challenge. So there's one, just to give sort of two possible ways of thinking about how to overcome it. So one is trial periods, which might work for some policies and, and not others. So you can say, we're going to do this policy for three years. Now there's problems with that because obviously then that doesn't provide the certainty, long-term certainty that businesses need and so on. 
but um, it, it, it might be better than nothing, uh, especially if it works and there's good reason to think that it'll work and therefore it'll be, become more popular. The other one I think is really about, so obviously there's a lot of good analysis, economic and otherwise, about the, uh, the effects of policy, right? So we can do analysis to illustrate what the likely effects are going to be. And the problem is that the good analysis often gets crowded out by the rubbish analysis, the, the, um, the hired guns who do the economic forecasting for the fossil fuel industry. And oh, surprisingly, it, it, it serves their interests. And just a kind of quick plug for uh, an outstanding think tank in Australia called the Australia Institute, who I've done some work with, full, full disclosure, un, unpaid though, I genuinely think they're excellent. They, they've tried to tackle this issue in, in a couple of ways. They do a lot of work on climate, but not only climate. Uh, and any of you familiar with Australia will know that it's particularly, uh, it's kind of the wild west when it comes to not just lobbying, but kind of corporate influence, fossil fuel influence on climate policy. And a couple of things that they've tried to do to perhaps address this informational environment so one is they've been strongly advocating truth in advertising laws and they've done a lot of really good work on on that which could potentially reduce some of the more egregious claims that, that are made about how climate policy is going to tank the economy and so on and they've also done some slightly more nerdy but i think quite quite nice work called called modeling watch and they basically just sort of keep tabs on really dodgy modeling and kind of do their best to kind of explain why it's dodgy and so sort of raising some of the issues around just the scaremongering that goes on um, yeah, in that, in that sort of chicken and egg gap that you highlight. Thank, thank you. I guess I'll, I'll finish just by responding very practically to the first more practical uh, question around how you, how you might measure uh, positive climate lobbying and explain very quickly how, how we try and do it at Influence Map. So the basis of what we do is, is a system of trying to track and measure how companies are lobbying on climate and whether this is Paris aligned or not. And the bench, so it's a benchmarking process. We are comparing the company statements against benchmarks that we are believed to be Paris aligned. And for the most part, we, we take these from the, we take this from the IPCC. So the in-depth reports from, from the scientists about the kind of um, pathways and uh, we need to, uh, to develop 1.5 C or 2 C and the, the policy mechanisms that might be helpful uh, to, to, to deliver that. And, you know, they're quite wide ranging in, in their advice and, and, and provide, Lots of content on how that how that might play out, and we try we try to factor in a, a pretty sort of what you know we, we try to be fair to the company's state statements when they're engaging on that. We you know there, there can be a lot of constructive engagement engagement even if there isn't that that isn't specific agreement uh, with different policy proposals, um, and there's sort of grey areas there. Um, so I think using something like the science or as close to you know the consensus science as, science as we can is the standard to uh, measure companies and hold them accountable is i guess what we have as the the best uh, the best kind of available option at the moment and and we do our best to, to do that assessments and feed them back to to different uh, people like company shareholders and and other and the media and whoever so we can provide that kind of um, transparency sort of forced force that transparency uh, on the companies by digging into a whole range of data sources that are publicly available but not very well known about including not only the company's disclosures but the consultation responses they're sending to governments and uh, the meetings they're having we spend a lot of time sending freedom of information requests to, uh, to get the details of those uh, we'd be very happy to be put out the job though um, by far more strict transparency regulations as well and there's there's various ways i think you could do this the the advertising regulations is, is super important i think another interesting angle is um regulators uh starting to consider whether they should be asking companies to put information about their policy agendas uh in sort of the regulated investor related disclosures so like the sec in the us and there's a similar process going on in, in Europe. And I think that kind of sort of legally binding uh, transparency would be a, a good way of, of dragging some of this information up and, and allowing the sort of wider, slightly more democratic assessment and understanding of where companies are positioned, you know, including their, their shareholders, but uh, the general public as well. Just to quickly, I don't, I don't think that would put you out of a job at all. I think actually it would just mean that you could focus your efforts more on the analysis and the right, but it would just mean you have better data sources and are better able to do your job, I would have thought. But, yeah. Okay, we well, make our job easier. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Michael? 
Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Lerner. I'm an assistant professor in the government department here at LSE, and um, I've really enjoyed your, your remarks. Um, I think that when we're talking about positive corporate climate lobbying, it's really helpful for, for distinguishing between denial and some, you know, the opposite of denial, some acknowledgement that this might be happening. But the current state of corporate opposition is not denial it's delay. So what I'm hearing is a lot of really wonderful thoughts about how to make sure that we don't do denial, like this code of conduct. But your example, which I think was referring to Toyota, when they were thinking about high hydrogen versus EVs. I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what can we do to get past the bare bones denial and really digging into this question of delay. Um, how do we distinguish delay from genuine principled engagement in these kinds of debates? Um, and maybe I'll leave it at that. I can jump straight in. I mean, to be fair, I, we, we see, I mean, we do, we assess, our assessments cover 400 companies and their industry groups. We barely see any denial anymore. Um, frankly, companies have moved on. Or well, in terms of like the classic denial, like denying denying the science, challenging its credibility. Um, you know, I think they see that as not the best tactic for them anymore. I th and, you know, it's it's probably um, had its played played its course for for the fossil fuel sector, and um, they seem. I think we see a lot more things like you would put under delayed tactics. Um, so from uh, you know, just throwing in technologies into the mix that, you know, like have very limited chance of every of actually being credible climate solutions, but just like pushing them really hard because they know it'll lock in gas investments mainly for the short term, um, through to just sort of overemphasizing the sort of short term economic impact on jobs and stuff like that. Those are the main tactics that, that we see. So I think it's 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 probably a good thing for frankly that we're at that level and not the denial anymore and also it gives uh, a space and platform for genuinely positive actors to come in and make well-founded arguments to sort of to tackle the, those those specific um yeah streams of thought um good question <laughs> i think um i mean again there's Transparency comes into play there, and to not to kind of mention it too many times, but the global standard on responsible climate lobbying. One of one of the expectations within that is about companies not just setting out their policies um, and what the basis is for them, and having a kind of one point five degree aligned commitment, um, but then on an annual basis reporting on how the activity that is carried out during that year has actually helped to deliver on that so not just helped to deliver on what the company's strategy is which is obviously a key part of the advocacy kind of dollars that are, are spent so I want to kind of further the interest of the company but how it's actually advanced you know alignment with a 1.5 transition that's married together with a credible transition plan so a credible transition plan that includes short medium and long-term targets not just something that's you know 30 years off in distance, the, the rationale that they're including there, it should, you know, when those things kind of drift out of sync, that should become apparent to people that are paying attention to it. So the shareholder analysts, the, the kind of academics looking at it, if they can't actually make a clear case for how, yes, waiting for carbon capture and storage or, you know, like all of the assumptions that are within the targets that they're, they're setting, if that technology isn't coming online and they're still lobbying for that as and, and granted that some of the policies that are being put in place now will obviously be baking particular, um, particular regulations into the system for, you know, a, a good time to come. But if they can't justify it on an annual basis, then, you know, their, their shareholders and indeed their consumers, their, their workforce needs to be asking sharp questions of actually how that stacks up in terms of being a legitimate kind of activity. Um, and I think that's the best we can kind of do at the moment is that through the kind of transparency of you know, disinfecting kind of sunlight, 
and enabling a variety of actors to be looking at that and seeing what the disjoint is between what companies are saying and actually what is feasibly kind of in, in place now that it, it should shake out um, where there is just, you know, absolute blue sky thinking over um, what part different technologies play in the transition. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, Birgit Weidemöre from Titan Swan, although I used to advise finance ministries globally and work with governments, etc. So I have I have two questions. The first question is: have you linked your analysis with the economic power of those companies? Let's say both positive and negative, to understand the balance of power on the side of positive and negative. And then the second question is really simple but not easy um how can we increase positive lobbying as an audience thank you as an audience here uh, can i take the second one <laughs> the second one first and i think i mean this this links as well to um Fergus's uh, point uh, that he made earlier about where is the finance sector in in this, and I think you know everyone sat in this room. You've got bank accounts. You've you've possibly, hopefully, got um, some level of uh, pension, or will have in the future. Um, possibly your own personal investments. I think asking questions of um, whoever those financial intermediaries are that are managing that money on your behalf, asking them what they're doing on this topic, um, because I think. Um, you know, companies, uh, you know, well, a lot of those financial institutions are corporations in them in themselves, and um, it's it's always easy to critique others in on, on any kind of issue, but it's a lot harder to actually kind of look at yourself and kind of go, well, where is our part in actually actively participating and proactively participating in this? Because I think the finance sector, we tend to kind of engage on financial regulation and that could easily you know keep you very busy in itself but actually if you're looking as the point Fergus was making earlier if you're looking well at, at portfolios and thinking well these these are kind of companies that are actually material you know that they're, they're crucial to the success of whether we can decarbonize our investments and these are the policy interventions that are necessary within these different industries. I think it's incumbent on the finance sector as well to be looking and saying, well, how can we amplify these kind of policies? Not because they directly affect us and our own business, but because actually they're enablers to the companies that we invest in being able to decarbonize and therefore that then in turn helps us to decarbonize. It's always an issue of um, kind of bandwidth and resource allocation to these things and, and looking um, to maybe think that it's someone else's responsibility. But, you know, I've, I've had conversations with companies within the, well, a company within the past year that has said, oh, well, it's not our job. It's not our job to be advocating for these policies. That's, you should be doing this as investors. And I think everyone, it's that kind of classic Spider-Man meme of everyone standing in a circle and kind of pointing at someone else. And I think as, again, consumers, as, people who are either currently working or will go on to work within some of these businesses be asking these questions um, because there's nothing like a good question as you're demonstrating to kind of hopefully enable a bit of self-reflection and a change in the position. Thank you. Anybody else wants to comment? I can answer that. The first one, have we uh, combined our analysis with an assessment of a company's economic and political clout? Uh, yes. Uh, once a year, we release a report called the Climate Policy Footprint Report. I wasn't going to plug it, but since you asked, we're releasing the next one on Wednesday, so keep <laughs> keep an eye out for it. It's quite a simple um, addition to our normal metrics where we just put, you know, their, their Forbes 20,000 ranking. We, we've used the metrics within that in terms of their economic clout and use that as a proxy for their general influence. And combining the two uh, gives us a list of who we think the most influential and negative companies um globally are focus on the negative for this report a few more positive ones comes out later it's called the a list but it throws up some interesting findings 
someone mentioned Toyota earlier, um, so we'll bring them up. They managed to feature very high, a very high level in that list, even though they're not, you know, quote unquote fossil fuel company because of their agenda against EV policies globally and their economic um, weight weight in, in, in very many economies. So yeah, kind of throws up. This is a very important aspect to consider. Yeah, I, I guess maybe a slightly indirect answer to the second question. Um, how do we how do we increase positive lobbying? I'm not sure I know the answer, but I'm also not sure I think that's the biggest part of the answer of how we get to where we need to go. So I, as I've said, I agree, completely agree that it's that it's important. I suppose I'm thinking of how we can more fundamentally like transform the system, <laughs> uh, I suppose. Um, and maybe there's a role for positive lobbying in that. I'd like to think so. But I feel like if there is, that will itself require some more fundamental transformation. So maybe yeah, I'll, I'll make that slightly more concrete. So I'm no expert on the financial sector, certainly not with, well, with both of these, especially Claire um, next to me. But I did attend a talk a couple of weeks ago, uh, which was fascinating by a guy called Ben Braun, who's an academic at the Max Planck Institute. And it was a UCL talk. And he was talking about asset manager capitalism. And so this is like looking at the Black Rocks and the vanguards of the world who are they're universal owners. They own a staggering amount of shares across the economy in, in, in many parts of the world. And so they should, in theory, behave like a universal owner ideally should, right? They should be concerned about the externalities from one of those sectors to the other one. And so I, I asked him basically, you know, like why are they not, you know, what's the reason, right, that they're not advocating more for these, these kinds of policies? Why are they not the, the model positive lobbyists? And I think part of the answer was about their, their kind of short-term orientation. And Ben basically sort of, brought it back to the, the pension system. It says, you know, they rely very heavily on a financially intermediated pension sector. And so they lobby very, very hard and they'd be very, very, very concerned with sort of attempts for what he called the big green state model and attempts more generally to bring the pension system into state ownership. Uh, and so you basically have people paying into the state for pension and then they would pay out defined benefits. That's kind of their biggest threat because that will dry up all of their, all of their capital. But if we actually do want long-term patient capital invested in the green transition, that's kind of what we need. So, um, so I suppose it's, yeah, that's a sort of slightly more indirect answer, but I think that it's going to require really major transformations in the financial system among others. In actually, in, in order to get where we need to go. Thank you. Um, yeah. If I could just quickly say, yeah, sure. oh, Influence Map, this isn't a plug because I don't work there, but Influence Map also do finance map, don't you? Which is about looking at how different asset managers um, are performing on, on climate lobbying and transparency as well. So it's definitely, there's a, there's a whole raft of information on, on their uh, website which you can spin off into whatever the flavor is that, that you want. But I think the, the Finance Map one is particularly. Um, interesting because even in terms of making just a commitment to Paris aligned lobbying there aren't very many investors that have done that yet and that is something that we turn to you know big listed companies in the real economy as being you know starting point number one um, but we're not really doing it um, ourselves as an industry so I think there's a disconnect there. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? We have time. Yes, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Klaus. I work for a policy think tank in the climate space. Um, I was wondering how much do you think the positive corporate climate lobbying space is aware of a potential just transition problem? Um, maybe positive corporate climate lobbyists in the European market are fighting transition losers that have vested interests in, say, uh, coal, oil, gas. In developing countries, that transition loser might look quite different. It might be a less consolidated industry, uh, MSMEs that don't have the capacity to take on a climate technology that's quite expensive. So some of the positive corporate climate lobbyists 
in Europe, when they go abroad and lobby for positive climate policies, you get uh, an adverse outcome, which displaces local industry, potentially reinforces colonial structures. Um, is, is that being taken into account in, in any degree? Um, yeah, I can't. I work on just transition, but not that specifically. I think that I think um, there's an interest. There's definitely an interesting flip side to that. That I don't know, actually, we've kind of looked at the displacement side, um, but I suppose you know again that for uh, you know policy has to be kind of context specific or region specific. Um, there isn't really a well, one size fits the entire globe on this, but I think that the omission of transparency on on lobbying and proactive lobbying just full stop leads to those kind of negative outcomes as well because of the fact that you know companies can be burnishing their green credentials within developed markets be that Europe or or the US or, or wherever and saying well you know we'll yes we're abiding by we're supportive of the EU targets for say tailpipe emissions um, or issues like that but whilst quietly continuing to sell and market and intend to continue to sell the old technology in other markets on the basis of say well oh well there isn't the infrastructure in place there um so we can't we can't be setting targets in other markets because you know consumers there won't be able to actually buy these products they won't be able to run them and that again is where asking companies to disclose well in order for you to be able to transition the business sustainably um, and decarbonize the, the the business sustainably. What are the policies that are, what are the incentives that are required in other parts of the world where you could have that kind of leapfrog um, infrastructure or, or kind of technology that would um, enable that to be possible? So it's not so much about the the disincentive side, but I think you know what what we see in the just transition is. Again, I mean, say not going to mention the name, but a kind of oil and gas company looking to do kind of drilling or, or kind of seismic blasts off the coast of uh, South Africa on the basis that that was helping with energy security for um, a population that is otherwise kind of underserved by um, energy, you know, uh, the energy that's required for the economy. But actually, that's not that's not in the long term interests of the you know NDC the, the kind of delivery of the targets of that region it's that's the kind of using say the just weaponizing the just transition really by saying oh well we're helping we're helping to bring energy to somewhere without it actually really being bedded in a kind of holistic look at what what that means for the kind of future um so I think it's an interesting it's an interesting angle that you bring there I think also you know as I said for the positive lobbying side, we're, this, we're quite short on examples of that at the moment. I think it will be that will be a, a good lens to be applying to it when we are looking, um, seeing more in practice. Yeah, just to add to that, I, I suppose I, I think um, there's the sort of developing country specific angle, but there's a, a more general sort of issue. I think that your question your question gets at, which is an important one, which is that. And I suppose it, it speaks to why I was perhaps a little bit cautious in my endorsement of positive lobbying and sort of the, some of the democratic problems, right? Which is that we can have a, a low carbon transition that can basically be a green form of our current radically unequal, financialized, insecure form of capitalism that we have now. Uh, well, potentially we can't have those things, but at least there's, there's certainly one vision of the green transition, right, which is which is like that, and uh, and that could be you know companies could in theory lobby for that in terms of positive climate lobbying anywhere in the world, right, and and so I think this is part of the problem of sort of kind of entrusting the solution to the the sort of the renewable energy industry or you know, the kind of green industries more generally. And part of the reason why I still worry about the democratic deficit 
and the deeper systemic problems in our democracies more generally. Uh, because I think that if you have a, you know, and whilst this is somewhat utopian, I don't think it's totally utopian, but if you do have a more civically engaged citizenry, a more equal citizenry, uh, if, if corporations have less power, if lobbying is less of a feature of, of one's democracy, then I think you will you will get policies that, that don't have those problems as well, because they're going to be addressing a much more diverse range of issues and challenges and needs than just sort of just decarbonisation, as in uh, uh, rather than only decarbonisation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions in the room? Okay. Uh, Marty, would you like to check if we have any online questions, please? Okay, um, so question from Kian Mintz Wu, philosopher at University College Cork. Ed mentioned Salesforce and Unilever, they are definitely green leaders, but what's the best case for th not thinking of them as just the exceptions that prove the rule? Um, well, I think there are, there are a few different... I mean, I'd, I'd say there are there are some. I mean, I, I, I picked out a couple of examples. There are probably a broader range of companies that are engaging to some level, level in, in a more positive way. Um, these are a slight uh, anom anomalies because of the extent to which they engage, and also the fact that in our assessment, we find broadly across the, the different types of policy, they they generally are supportive. There's no sort of there's not many sort of any risk areas or, or sort of skeletons in, in, cover, in cupboards when it comes specifically down to the climate issue I and mean, the other ESG issues let's not go there but like just for the just for the climate they're, they're, they're pretty good so I think getting companies up to that level I think is it's a, it's you know it's enforcing these standards and then pushing them through uh, levers like the investors um, or regulating um, higher standards of regulated disclosure and things like that to emphasize how it's important and I think Claire spoke to a lot of other the, the, maybe individual company motivations for wanting to get there. But, you know, I think there's a whole range of positive corporate lobbying that happens in other types of companies as well, but they may be choosing one or two different policies that they see um, some benefit of them in getting involved in, um, whether that's a direct economic benefit or a wider sort of sustainability agenda for them. Um, and I, so I think there, you know, there's going to be a bit of a natural process. Is the more the more policy there is, the more opportunities there are, and the more you'll see companies latch on to these policies and try and get involved. But I think pushing, you know, a bit of advocacy and pushing and other outside strategies to to get companies to make this get get to this place and start taking this seriously and start incorporating it into their wider strategies is super helpful. And we've talked about some of the levers that can do that. I think, I mean, and there are also, you know, there are, there are kind of industry-ish led uh, coalitions like, say, We in Business that are also trying to act as a kind of positive reinforcer and that kind of um, upwards peer pressure um, for um, companies to actually speak up on, on these issues, um, which, you know, I think all of these different um, kind of uh, pressure points will hopefully lead to less, like companies being less of an outlier for lobbying positively or being identified in that respect and that that becomes much more the norm. Um, so we have to do less kind of mitigation of the negative uh, lobbying. Um, yeah, are there any other questions on that? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. So question from Sebastian Akbik from the PRI. Do you see a concern with companies doing positive lobbying in, for example, the UK, but lobbying ne negatively in, for example, Mexico on the same issue? Yeah, yes, I mean, <laughs> definitely. And it's actually, I was gonna respond to this from another similar question, which identified a really important problem, but I think it's it's kind of even worse sometimes where we actually see companies that have moved to quite positive positions on certain policies in markets like Europe, but shift or sort of break their strategy in two where they continue to sell or push their products that are highly polluting in other markets, especially in the global south. And 
but though our coverage isn't as good, you know, we're, we're assuming there's probably some policy engagement activities to, to support that. And the real problem, or I mean, even in a more immediate example in, in Europe with the sudden need to uh, get as much gas as possible to um, stockpile over the winter, that's meant a big pressure in, in some of these new regions um, and investing in further gas infrastructure to support that. The problem with that in the future is that as Europe does implement these more stringent climate policies, in particular product standards, then all of a sudden the market or broader market for the more polluting industries or big market will dry up and you'll end up with um, you know, these these other countries being even left behind even further. So yeah, it is a is a huge problem, even though climate positive corporate climate lobbyists haven't really got their heads around this. And I think it's it's something that needs a lot of attention going forward. Um, yeah, so we, we've run out of time. Um, so are there, were there any other questions online or, yeah? Um, just a couple, but. Yeah, yeah I think we'll we have to leave them. Sorry, sorry to be on the audience. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone for coming, asking questions. Thanks, Mari Dios, for helping me organize the event. And please join me in thanking the speakers for a brilliant discussion.